Good evening, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting of the Development Review Board of the City of Montpelier to order. My name is Daniel Richardson. I serve as chair. The other members from my right are Kevin O'Connell, Deb Markowitz, Meredith Crandall, staff, Kate McCarthy, Brian Kane, Tom Kester. And the first item of business is approval of the agenda. Uh, does anyone have a motion to approve the agenda, or do they, does anyone wish to uh, modify the agenda with an addition? So moved. Motion by Deb. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Tom. Uh, a discussion? Discussion point on the agenda. Um, we have been notified that item five on the list has been withdrawn and will not be reviewed tonight. And item five on the list is um, 41 College Street, Vermont College of Fine Arts, for anyone who might be here for that. Right. I was going to, yeah, um, we'll take that. We can take that up formally. Okay. Um, but that actually. Yeah, that, that's what I was. I was going to mention it. Okay. So. Yeah, we can do it here now. So if anyone's here for the 41 College Street, that uh, application has been withdrawn. It's been completely withdrawn, so there will be new notice um, when they refile a fresh application. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, let me offer a friendly amendment to the motion uh, for the agenda to remove item five. So moved. Yeah, accepted. Accepted. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the agenda as modified, please raise your right hand. We have an agenda. Uh, the only comments from the chair tonight is I want to recognize Deb Markowitz, uh, our uh, illustrious member and uh, soon to be departed former member. Yeah, I'm sorry to say I'm, I feel real sad about it because I'm pretty new on the board, but. I've taken a job in Boston, and I'll be oh. going back and forth, but um, it's it'll be too difficult to make sure I'm here on Monday nights, the hmm. April Monday nights. Well, thank you very so much. So I'll miss you all, and mm -hmm. there'll be another time when maybe I'll get back on board when I'm back here. We'll, we'll keep the spot open. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. You should yeah. definitely not do that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much for for helping us, you know, with this this transition from the old board to the new board, as well as the new regulations. And it's you been know, a pleasure. It's been it, it's been a pleasure on this end to have you as a member of the board. Um, thank you, and yeah. thank you, and congratulations. Thank you. I mean, this is a good reason to move up. Uh, those are the only comments uh, from the chair. The approval of the minutes for April fifteenth, two thousand nineteen. Uh, myself, Kevin, Kate, Tom, Ryan were here. Uh, so we do have a quorum. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes or modify them? I have one question. Um, for the other business, um, for the Caledonia Spirits, it says here that they would like to paint distillery in very large letters. Was it they were going to paint or were they going to install letters? I don't remember. Exactly. My understanding was paint. Was yeah, paint on the side. Okay. Was paint. Then I'll go to. Okay. That with that burning question answered, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of April 15th? So moved. Motion by Ryan. Second. Second. Second by Tom. All those in favor and eligible to vote for the approval of the April 15th minutes, please raise your right hand. <coughs> they are approved. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your patience with that housekeeping. With the removal of 41 College Street, that brings us to 217 North Street as our first application of the evening. Mr. Shabam, you want to come forward? And, uh, Some additional materials. Well, we're going to swear you in. I just want to get a sense to, is anyone else here to speak or comment on the uh, 217 North Street application? Yes, Nick Persantieri, I live at 191 North Street. Okay. Uh, well, what I'll do is I'll have both of you, I'll uh, put you both under oath for any of the statements you're about to offer. And what we'll do, uh, Mr. Uh, per Sam Perry? Per Sam Perry. Per Sam Perry, I apologize. Um, is that. Uh, Mr. Shabon will have an opportunity to go first uh, to present his case. We'll ha I mean, to present his application. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for questions from the board. If you have any questions, I'll, ha I'll make sure to have an opportunity to allow you to ask them afterwards. If you want to put forward any 
further consideration um, or evidence, uh, there'll be an opportunity as well. So, uh, but in normal practice, we allow the applicant to go first, but we'll put you both under oath just so we don't have to deal with that later on. Anyone else about this application? All right, so if those of you testifying, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? All right. So, Mr. Shabom, the floor is yours. Why don't you walk us through the application and submit any additional documents you wish to give? Street and uh, planning to build um, a 734 square foot um, accessory dwelling unit, single story. Um, and the reason it's here is for the steep slopes. So it's going to be the guinea pig for the internal conditions and the zoning regulations. Uh, the documents that are submitted today are sort of the final grading plan to go to control uh, this I prepared between myself and Don Marsh from Greeninger Engineering. And then there's also the letter from him as well as Kurt Modicus, uh comments about all of this. And uh, yeah, as some of you know, I live at 217 and I'm also a contractor, so I'll be in charge of building the project in addition to being the owner. And uh, for my mother, We'll be moving here from Syracuse, New York, live in Montpelier, close to grandkids and myself. And, uh, yeah, there's definitely some challenges, as you can probably see, um, depending on where you take your elevation. It's anywhere from 22 to 31% slope. Uh, access is pretty much already existing as far as vehicular access. There's actually a historical driveway. That's right past the um, proposed building site for a house that doesn't exist anymore, actually, on a nearby property. Started now. Um, so there was a driveway that used to go up, and instead of going to the left, is yes. where your house is, it would go to the right. Go right. So as far as a driveway is concerned, um, and this is somewhat of a random spot to drop in, but nevertheless raised by your issue, yeah. um, how much of the driveway is changing as a result of this? Really nothing is changing for the most part. I mean, it's basically like the, sort of the proposed, you know, parking spot, you know, right next to the, um, I would say, kind of in between the, the building and the rain garden mm -hmm. um, to the west. I would say of the, um, the building. That's kind of is, is you have the, the, the existing site plan and the proposed site plan. I unfortunately just have the final erosion control plan in front of me. Um, okay. But it shows kind of where that existing driveway goes up. And we sort of use it as an overflow right now. Well, I'm looking at drawing number A03, uh, yeah. proposed site plan, which seems to have the yeah. parking laid out on it. Yeah. And so so I see the existing parking. You go over a little bridge yeah. and the two two spots in front of your, your house. Mm -hmm. But then the other, and I presume that the blue shaded area is the driveway. That's, that's pretty much currently. Uh, okay, so that's that's for the most part uh, as it exists currently. Yeah, and that one that your finger's on right now there. Right. It's kind of like a historic old driveway that's not official driveway right now. Okay. That's sort of the, the, the new proposed parking spot right there. Okay. So. And we probably won't even actually do it. I'm just looking to get it basically permitted for if in the future we decide 
to actually do some grading or remove a tree here and there. But as I said, it's currently used as overflow. <laughs> Well, I know that one of the comments that the neighbor had passed along was the question of whether or not that parking space was necessary or could be moved. Um, I apologize. So I have to it's definitely my... not necessary to be required parking. Right. But the, the comments were a little bit more pointed than that. Um, the... He suggested in, in, in an email that was included in our packet to remove the parking spot proposed for the west side of the building near his property line and replace it with a second parking spot to the north of the building where you currently, meaning you, the applicant, currently proposed one parking spot. This will serve both to prevent soil compaction from impacting the roots of a large tree along the property line and to eliminate views of a parked car from my property fine with you retaining a bit of stub here that could be used for a vehicle turnaround. Yeah, which is kind of what we do, is just turnaround. There is, I mean, you can park two spots, just, you, know, you can park two cars already. From the north of the building. You can? Yeah. Okay, so this this sort of, and, and just to orient, so going back to a, A03, this this spot here, we have one car that is this is this is essentially the north area. Yeah, this for the most part, you can put two. Cars you can put two cars there, and I mean, is this something where if this was sort of evened out, so it was a rectangle as opposed to this sort of yeah trapezoidal I mean, figure, um, you, you could park two cars there, and what you're saying is this this stub already exists to a large extent. Yeah, you, and you can park a car there. You can. It can already fit there. Yeah. Okay. So you're not putting in anything new. Not essentially. essentially no. You're just identifying that's a spot for a car. Yeah. And and on this, um, I'm wondering where the I don't see on this drawing where the new structure will be um, relating relating to that parking spot. On the proposed on, site plan. Um, so oh, this is you're on AO2, which is existing. Yeah. Uh, the next one, AO3. I just didn't turn yeah. it over. Yeah, it's probably have a lot of. Oh, here we go. Yes. There's a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I see. I see. So, I, I see. So you've identified the, two spots. And then the, the document I submitted today is much more detailed. AO5. Okay. And just as you know, staff making a comment here, it looks like the, the stub that's going around the west side of the mm -hmm. house, you're actually proposing shortening that and maybe filling in with grass or the path, yeah, it looks exactly. like, to make that it's, shorter it's, for it's where people can actually kind of drive. Feels, you know, much further up. You know, mm -hmm. I could drive much further up, you know, if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that'll be shortened significantly. And then there'll be a pedestrian access up around the area. Okay. So I think the it probably makes sense to go straight for the steep slope yeah. issue, um, which is the main driver of the application, as you correctly identified. And so just for, I think, both your consumption as well as the public's, you know, prior to an in interim zoning bylaw change, steep slopes 30% or greater were just simply undevelopable in, in the city under the 2018 zoning bylaws. Those have been modified, however, um, to allow for um, the development with a grading plan that's signed and sealed by a licensed engineer and a hearing to address some of the concerns about the purposes of the steep slopes provision, which is to protect public safety and property, to minimize the potential for erosion, runoff, flooding, and degradation of water quality, and to avoid the increased cost of providing services to remote or difficult to access land. Um, and so there's a number of issues, and as you correctly point out as well, you're the first one to go through this. So just, I think, as a threshold question, um, what portions of this project uh, are the 30% slopes? Um, there is a slope map in your package that, that 
you know, I mean, obviously it's with more data, you can get more clarity. And, and it would be that A4. Yeah. And A5. And, and A05 gives you a sense with the house on it. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I initially, prior to having them come out and gone out there with my transit and shots and elevations, and I came up with a number of different, as I said, depending on where you take it and what angle, it's, you know, anywhere mm -hmm. from 22 to 31 percent. So, um, pretty much the majority of the house site is <coughs> on slope. That is, as I said, it depends on where you take your data points. Right. But yeah, the long axis, if you look at AO5B, you know, the longest axis of the building Forty feet over a ten foot rise, so it's essentially twenty four percent slope. Um, but some of the shorter legs have different slopes. But for for all practical purposes, we'll just call the whole thing. Dirty. Well, I mean, you know, we're talking about a, a twenty two percent slope on the long side. Is yeah. this, is that right? Um, uh, minus, yeah. And then a twenty nine percent slope. Uh, sort of from corner to corner, mm -hmm. and then a 27% slope. So it yeah. seems like we're just under that 30% uh, yeah, the, threshold. The, the, the stamped engineered grading plan is 25% or greater. Okay. Um, and so to that end, you've submitted uh, a letter from Don Marsh. Mm -hmm. uh, basically... That he's reviewed the topography of the lot yeah. related to the pro proposed addition of a one bedroom house at 217 North Street. There's some steep slopes and surface water drainage which needs to be addressed. However, both these issues have been addressed in the revised site, site plan. So, okay, so now that we, we understand really we're talking about the house site itself, and, and to be clear, it's just this new house, even though some of the steep slopes affect other portions of the property, yeah. it's really only the portion that where you're seeking to build the house. Yeah. What are the changes that have been made from your initial application to the current one tonight? Um, and could you walk us through what those changes have done uh, well, to address the issues? Yeah, primarily a lot of it is in terms of, you know, final grading plan, and erosion control measures. You know, I take it, you know, the, the proposed grading, the erosion control, AO5D, which you have is stated five, Mm -hmm. You know, that's taken into consideration uh, some of Nick's concerns, you know, when he's meeting with his uh, engineers. Uh, but basically just kind of showing, you know, where the water is going and how we're going to deal with it. Uh, Kurt really wanted to see the existing contour in relationship with the proposed contours. So that's been added. And then a variety of details in terms of swales and silt fence, construction access, and rain gardens. That's kind of, a lot of that stuff is what's sort of been added. So on um, AO5B, could, could you just orient me a little to where I'm seeing the existing um, topo left, the existing grade compared to new? Can you show me how that's represented on the map? Um, is it the gray area? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, like the existing is the dot and underlying those. Okay. Yeah, and then that's sort of the, the one foot contours are the, the, the proposed, you know, like the show symbols on the side. Um, so it's right here, these darker. Yeah, so that's like, that's this one, like this, you know, that's the original. Mm -hmm. And then these are the sort of changed ones. Okay. Does that mean this area is getting steeper? Um, no, it's just uh, this is the, is the proposed is a one foot contour. Oh, okay. And the existing is a two foot contour, so it's, it's greater clarity. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. So, as a result of this building, let me uh, let me start with the question of whether or not this will change any of the slopes from their current configuration to a sharper configuration. Um. I hope not. I mean, that, the, the plan was, and the way it was designed, was essentially to sort of fit within the hillside as it currently exists mm -hmm. in a way to sort of minimize disturbance. And we're not trying to make like a flat backyard or anything like that. You know, you know, right. The, the plan is to basically just like put the building in the slope so that it looks like it sort of grew out of it. And then there'll be some minor, minor site alterations to deal with um, 
from one or not. Well, well, I think that's that's leading into my next question, which is, you know, given that you're not seeking to change the overall slope, you are putting a building which will essentially act as a block for any water that currently just sort of runs off or goes into the ground. What is, could you describe the plan for the storm water uh, runoff that's going to be affected by the construction of this building? Yeah, I mean, I think, the, so the current runoff is, um, it just kind of comes down and some of it goes into the stream, some of it goes into the street when there's heavy rains. But, uh, you know, the building is kind of designed to sort of wedge into the hillside versus being completely perpendicular to the slope. So as to sort of divert it around rather than just completely block it. Um, and then there is some natural undulations in the mm -hmm. existing slope, just due to the way that the forests have, they're not totally planar. Um, but basically there'll be an uphill swale uh, along the sort of east side of the building to catch the majority of any water coming down the slope and direct it over towards uh, a little rain garden near the sort of existing parking area and then there's a stream sometimes it's dry sometimes it is very very active um, that any overflow from that will then go into the stream and then the other little sort of smaller swale on the south side that kind of loops around the west side of the building um, we'll probably see a lot less of the um, you know the way I see it is the majority of it will be caught by that one that's on the east side directing it straight towards the um, stream and whatever kind of other elements will be to keep any um, water coming from under the property. And then gutter downspouts tied into the perimeter drain foundation. Okay, and the second rain garden that's being proposed um, what's effectively the west side. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a new change from the original application. Yeah, yeah we, it, was, it was moved. It was further up along the property line. Okay. And is that intended to, is that to, why was it moved? Let me ask that. Well, that was at a suggestion from Nick. Okay. Um, you know, we talked, I met with his engineer, and that was one of the suggestions they made. It seemed like a more logical place for it. Okay. Just a little bit further away from the property line. And then it also allows for the overflow from that to sort of tie in through probably an underground, you know, pipe, an outlet pipe into the other ring. Mm -hmm. What's the square footage of the house? Um, well, the footprint is 734, but the finished interior is about 650. Okay. Thick walls. Yeah. That's a lot. <clears throat> well, um, I should know this, but it says that the gutter downspout is tied into a perimeter drain. And where's the perimeter drain? Um, um, it's going to go um, out. Come to daylight, basically into that rain garden as well. Into the um, the westerly rain garden on the property. The northern line? one. The northern one. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Pretty much everything will go into that northern one. That's sort of the main catchment along the parking area, mm -hmm. whatever comes into that. I don't. I don't anticipate seeing that. that um, West really wants to see a whole lot of this um, action. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I really want to make sure I protect my neighbor's property. And I'll note that uh, you also submitted uh, an email from the city engineer uh, saying that with these revisions, he was satisfied mm -hmm. with his concerns. Um, and Kurt's been out there as well. Okay. So, <clears throat> have you done like a cut fill kind of analysis for? Seems like you're going to end up taking a lot out to put your cellar hole and put the building yeah, in. Yeah, it's essentially a full height basement wall in the back and then walk out. And so, it, where's all that fill going? That's going to be trucked off site. I have a location where it's going to be. Okay. We're really not going to, I mean, we might keep some topsoil. Sure. A little bit. You know, we mm -hmm. have it. Um, yeah, I haven't marked out sort of the temporary soil storage area, but mm -hmm. yeah. Need any? Uh, <laughs> whatever, a couple of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, during construction, do you have an erosion control plan? Well, that's this AO5B okay. <clears throat> shows where silt fence are, and then AO5C shows the uh, silt fence detail. Okay, so the red is the silt fence. Yep. 
and so these will be these are the sill fences that will be erected during construction mm -hmm. um, and is it the idea that you construct the building then install the uh, swales and the rain yeah, gardens. Be after sort of final backfilling, and the mm -hmm. upper swale along the east side is going to be pretty much right at the perimeter of the building. And then the silt fences are removed after yeah, all that we'll work. Yeah, probably stay up for the complete duration of the project. You know, and then you might remove the one where the temporary soil storage is, just for vehicle access or whatnot. But. Okay, uh, so just going through, we, we've been touching upon these. I think one of the points that the applicant is expected to meet is to limit the amount of disturbance, clearing of existing natural vegetation and impervious surface. Will there be any blasting? Cross my fingers, I hope not. Okay, so. But, you know, I've, you know, I've worked the site next door and, and you know, there's nothing that indicates there's any ledge there. Okay, so this is mostly uh, just soil. Yeah. Um, and in, uh, so the limit the amount of disturbance and clearing of existing natural vegetation and pervious surface to order to minimize potential for erosion, stormwater, runoff, flooding, and water quality impairment. Um, apart from the silt fences, is there any other sort of uh, erosion control planned for the during construction? Um, I have water bars in the driveway, you know, if there's any significant amount from, say, mm -hmm. and they should all be contained within the silt fences for the most part, you know, I mean, I don't have water bars in my current driveway. Right. Uh, but, uh, no, there's not, I mean, we might do something up the hill, you know, I mean, we might even put the upper swale in, you know, like sort of a sort of rough draft prior to the minute, just so that any water coming down the hill during the construction is not going to go straight into the foundation hole. Right, right. So we'll probably do that swale first and then. Okay. Um, so you're not creating a slope that's steeper in 30%. You're preserving distinctive natural features, the general topography of the site and existing natural vegetation. The testimonies yeah. that you're putting this sort of at an angle to where the, the water flows. Yeah. Uh, it's a limited footprint of 750 square feet. Um, maintain or reduce the pre-existing rate and retain the pattern of storm water runoff leaving the property. Um, so as a currently now, it, let me ask this is, is the, when the rain gardens are installed and the swales are installed, do you expect more, less, or the same amount of sort of stormwater runoff from the property? The same or less, ultimately. Okay. I think, you know, I mean, if I can keep more water on my land, that's probably a good thing. I, I, well, and this will betray some of my ignorance about rain gardens, but are they ex expected to act as a sort of retention pond quality? I mean, yeah, on a very small scale to a certain extent, you know, I mean, I think it's basically just kind of slows it down, mm -hmm. stops it, it can sink in. You know you can use them for, you know, bio sweat. Yeah, just kind of holds it for a minute, you know, it's not a retention pond. Okay. You know. yeah. it, it slows it down and reduces the Erosion because it slows the water and the silt has time to settle yeah, out as right, well. Yeah. And I know that one of Department of Public Works concerns was making sure that what runoff there was didn't flow into the road. So directing this into the stream, I think, will probably reduce. Mm -hmm. I know that was one of the things that I think Kurt mentioned in some of the comments. Right. I mean, I, I know that there's there have been and other properties severe runoff issues coming off that hill. Um. I wonder if we could explore that for a minute. I have, um, I live up the street, yeah. as you know, mm -hmm. um, and I remember, well, here comes some anecdata. I don't know what caused this, but I'll mention it. So two years ago, there was a pretty bad blow. Was it two years ago, a year ago? Really bad blowout, I'm sure you remember, with lots of cones up and some erosion and flashing lights working on it at night. Does this sound, am I remembering this correctly? Like a really, a really bad runoff event that damaged the road. Well, there is basically so the origin. Are you thinking of that stream in particular that crosses through my property? I, I, I can't uh, say for that. sure what caused that, and yeah. and I don't know that your property caused yeah. it. I, but what I'm getting at is that that's, as you know very well, like a very complicated couple of parcels next mm -hmm. to each other, and it's one of the reasons we had a hard time subdividing it five or six years ago. Um, so because this is asking about 
maintaining or reducing the pre-existing rate and retaining the pattern of stormwater runoff leaving the property. I want to get a sense of whether the way that stormwater leaves the property is now, yeah, I think how that is working, considering yeah. I noticed that one thing at one time. Yeah, in my experience, having lived there for two years now and on the property for three years, plus or minus, is that, you know, my particular parcel is ultimately not contributing to any significant, like, detrimental, harmful runoff. Mm -hmm. The source, the origin of that stream is a large retention pond uphill that basically collects everything from Murray Hill. And to my understanding, that is in the process of being upgraded, what I've been told from public works. I mean, I've been up there when it is like that stream that goes through my property looks like Whitewater Rapids and it's plugged up the culvert under North Street. And I've run up to that retention pond to see like if this thing's totally full and if it's doing its job and it's empty and water is fire hosing out of the outlet pond. So. Mm. Um, Okay, so it's a stomach issue, is yeah. what I'm hearing. If anything, I'm trying to help to keep as much water on my property as possible, slow it, sink it, spread it. You know. That's <laughs> so. a pneumatic device. Um, okay, thanks. So thank you for answering that yeah. question, considering I had sort of just a partial observation there. Thing, but I mean, I've definitely seen them digging I feel like I came back from DRB one night, and there was all sorts of activity. <clears throat> maybe, I may be yeah. misremembering it. It's probably a really long DRB meeting. But. Um, I, I know that to be flashy. By Hillhead too, I remember something. Well, it seems likely. Yeah, yeah. CP <laughs> area. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the next issue is whether or not to this project produces a final grade that's compatible with the surrounding natural terrain. Because I'm understanding from your testimony that this final project, essentially putting this house into the terrain, but the, the surrounding terrain will largely stay as it is that sort of undulates down yeah. with a general downhill direction. Um, create a harmonious transition between grade slopes and the natural terrain. You're not really creating, you know, yeah. terracing or, or doing any. No, I, mean, I think there'll be some minor landscaping features, but nothing significant. Well, actually, that raises a question, you know, with the house itself, is there expected to be sort of a single grade around the house? Well, I mean, I think like, you know, the, the east side will have a swale coming up to it, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, each, each side will have, you know, I mean, if I can slope it slightly away, you know, it'll be sloped in two directions, you know, for instance, the sort of south face, you know, 16 foot long will sort of slope away, but then it will also be sloping sort of parallel to the wall. You know, the foundation is a fairly complicated stepped foundation and whatnot, so it'll be... Right. It's not like it's going to be flat. It's not like you're putting a box on a hill. No, let's see. Um, and I'll note, it, note that the swales themselves are f run fairly close to the building itself, so those will help with any transitions from yeah. grading away to the sort of more natural uh, yeah. topography. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the other thing, um, I don't know if, it, if it's in the, one of the details on AO5B would be um, the east wall of the building swale, you know, it's basically going to be like, you know, a foot or two of crushed stone right next to the foundation all the way down to the perimeter drain. So if there is for some reason any like, sudden you know, uh -huh. influx of rain that can just go down and out, you know, so there's some redundancy in dealing with water. Okay. Um. Creating a harmonious transition between graded slopes and the natural terrain. I think we've covered that. Avoid creating continuous unbroken slopes or linear slope. Excuse me. Linear slopes, and so that's really the purpose of the swales, right? Is to. Well, yeah, I mean, as I said, you know, I mean, it's just built like a completely flat, you know, it could make a very linear slope, but I'm not planning to do that. Okay. Uh, whether it's con contour graded slopes by varying the slope increments to produce a final grade that undulates both vertically and horizontally. I think we've covered that in your testimony. Um, very cut and fill banks and terraces to provide, produce a final grade that is a visual interest and allows for naturalistic landscaping. And I think that also goes to your testimony as well as to the, the sort of complicated foundation of this with the stepped. Yeah. Uh, levels uh, and the 
the final one asks to consider use of retaining walls and terracing rather than cut and fill banks, but I don't think that's relevant here. I mean, the, the east wall is essentially designed to act as a retaining wall. Mm -hmm. Four foot square in the bottom. It's not going anywhere. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, no other retaining wall or anything. Yeah. So, and then um, there's actually, sorry, uh, there's four more points, and I think they're all largely covered. That's vary the pad elevations on site with multiple structures to follow the actual terrain, which you've testified it will. Uh, provide roads and drives that follow existing contours. You're actually not providing any new roads or drives. You're working with the existing ones that have sur largely survived several years of flood inundation coming off of the hill. Um, but if you wish to. Sorry, it does look like there's a little flattening that's going on in the proposed westerly parking spot by the yeah, old I road, mean, if, if that if remains. If we even decide to do that as yeah. during this phase, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's not an ideal parking spot now. It's definitely kind of angled. Um, you know, it wasn't, you, know, you could fit a car there, but, you know, if we in the future decide to sort of mm -hmm flatten it out, you know, we would probably potentially have to take down a big tree, which I don't want to do, so it's... Well, and I think we'll revisit that as well. I think one of the concerns that's driving the neighbor, it's not an un... It's not an irrational concern is, you know, the transition mm -hmm. having, and part of that is going to depend where the neighbor's house is located in proximity to this boundary line yeah. as well, and, and whether if there is if there is an existing sort of parking space there, um, you know, I think one of the realities is that we tend to park where there are parking spaces. And so, you know, whether there's, this is shown as a parking space or not, the fact that it's existing there as a driveway, short of it being turned into something else, will, I think, over time lead to that being used as a park, parking space, um, if not by you, than by maybe a less punctilious successor in title. Um, but nevertheless, I think you know it's it, it's something we have to be concerned about and and address and in cut at it from several different ways. Um, okay, uh, so we'll come back to that when we talk about landscaping. Um, use compacted building forms and or multi-story buildings to minimize building footprint. I think that's your testimony there. It's a is it a one-story house or? Yeah, it's essentially one story. There's like a four or five steps up, you know, so that when there's a back mm -hmm. sort of southeast corner there, it's, you know, your, the foundation wall will be like this, you know, but you'll be standing on like a little platform. It'll be like four or five steps up. Mm -hmm. Okay, and use split or multi-level building forms that step up or down the slope. Yes, I think you've just addressed that. Um, <clears throat> All right, uh, so I think we can move on unless anyone else has any questions about the design standards and the steep slopes. And then, yes, if, if you wouldn't mind coming up to the microphone, um, if you had a specific question about the steep slopes and design standards. Well, I was just wondering, um, is all of the water from all of the gutters going to be directed to the rain garden to the northwest? Yeah, to, to the north one, the north, yeah, northeast one. Northeast, I'm so it's sorry. It's going to be coming out here. OK. Yeah, because the majority of you know, the, the, the flat perimeter rain is going to be all around the country. And the gutter downspout will tie into it and then go out here. So. OK. And one other question, you referred to what was formerly a driveway going along the property boundary. Yeah. Um, are you planning to avoid running heavy equipment up that I mean, I during think construction? To, to a certain extent, we're going to have to, like, you know, we'll keep them close to, you know, as, as far away from the trees as possible. Um, I mean, we're planning to use, you know, it's going to be precision excavation for sure. You know, and there's there's measures you can use to help prevent compaction of roots. You know, putting down a layer of uh, like bark mulch, and then also like uh, most excavators have big mats that they can use to sort of limit compaction, which kind of spreads out the weight a little bit. So um, 
we'll do all we can to sort of protect um, those trees. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, it'll have to be, I mean, as I said, you know, I mean, maybe we will, I think the majority of the, the ultimately we're going to be building sort of a, a soil pile where the current parking is and sort of accessing from that way, just the, the nature of how we have to dig the footings. Um, yeah, and then once the excavator's in the cellar hole, we'll be able to do most of the digging from in there. So we'll do our best to, to avoid impacting those that area yeah so you're not planning to do any grading of no that. i don't th i think essentially it's like you know just enough digging to cut where the foundation is going to be we're not going to be cutting anything out over near those trees um, you know and i've spoken with other in addition to the excavator that i work with i've spoken with another landscaping company that um, has some expertise in the office and advice and i would avoid that yeah. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Just with regard to root compaction, we just got some uh, booklets in our office too. If you wanted to come in and look oh. at them, root compaction booklet. <laughs> it's never a dull moment in planning <laughs> and zoning. I'm reading today. Yeah. Sign up today. Okay. Uh, so moving along, um, section 3008 talks about erosion control um, and it talks about having a professional, professionally prepared erosion control plan. Um, and I believe your testimony was that Don Marsh had assisted you in developing this? Yeah, I've, I've prepared the primary plan and then Don came out to check the things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that should be fine. And then of course, Correspondence with Kirk, um, and I consulted the um, Vermont standards and specifications for erosion prevention and sediment control for some of the details um, about the silt fence. Okay. Uh, so this is actually, I think, a question for the board, and I'll ask, um, you know, this is one of our first issues that we've dealt with with the erosion control. It does talk about how the erosion control plan must be professionally prepared. Um, unlike the uh, steep slopes where we have an actual sort of standard of saying a engineer sign and seal saying this, is, this works, the question is, what do we feel as a board is necessary for an erosion control plan to be quote unquote professionally prepared? And I think, Will, your testimony is this sort of, it's both Don coming out giving advice, but it's really something you've developed in consultation with him as well as referring to the uh, erosion um, and yeah. sediment control plan. And he did stamp the yeah. erosion. Okay, so these are yes. these are stamped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. The last the pages I gave today, A O five B. Oh, sorry. Yep, I see that right here. Okay. You know, I remember talking with Mary about professional. Yeah. I am a professional designer and builder, but I'm not a licensed engineer. Mm-hmm. Are we satisfied with what, what's been presented? Well, I mean, this has been stamped by a licensed yeah. engineer, so I think yeah. we can kick the can. <laughs> yeah, I think we can. Yeah, so no, no, I, I'm sorry. I missed yeah. his stamp on. I missed the stamp on that one. I apologize. That's it's it's so, smaller on that one. Yeah. So in this, with this application, I mean, Meredith, I'm directing this question to you. Would this does this require professional engineer certification, or does it require a um, a review? and approval of the review, something short of the actual professional certification. It, it we, we literally, know, right? right, it literally says professionally prepared. That's all that's the guidance yeah. it gives. So, so in, right, so when we've had other, since I've been here, when we've had to require erosion control plans, um, it's been for say like the parking garage project where there's been a big enough budget that they have gotten somebody who is an erosion control specialist to yes. prepare the plan, a completely separate contractor. Right. But it doesn't say that has to happen. It just says professionally prepared. Right. I'm just concerned that I, mean, I, I think it's I think it's great that we that we are attentive to the details about what's going to happen with that storm water yeah. and, and, yeah. and take uh, every possible measure to ensure that it's not going to cause damage. Mm -hmm. right. But I think we also need to be concerned about the fact this is a 734 square foot project. We don't want it to be a, you know, $750,000 
budget. Oh, yep, I, and, and this is this, but this right. is one reason I. This isn't a question I can answer. So figuring out what your standard is for professionally prepared, especially for a project of this size. Mm -hmm. Right. I, and and I was guess brought up, especially yeah. before we had the stamped engineered. Yeah. Plan. Right. And I I just hadn't looked at the the second page with the big engineering stamp, so I may have asked a question that had already been answered. But um, I think we do exceed it on this project. Kevin, but I, I share, I mean, I think the concern we have to think about as a board going forward is, you know, projects like this and projects as we open up the 30% slope to development, you know, erosion is a big part of that. It's, and a, it's a sensitive area. We do want to be attentive to the details, but, but I think that we want to make sure that right. we don't overdo. Right. Well, no, that I... That's a lot of my similar sentiments as well. Well, and then also, I know you sort of want to kick it down the road, a little bit because we have a plan that's stamped mm -hmm. but in my book that means that the next application that comes down the road I'm going to suggest that if they can easily get an engineer to stamp it yep mm -hmm. well I think I mean I we don't need to decide this here but I share Kevin's sentiment that professionally prepared is going to vary the requirements of that are going to vary based on the complexity of the project mm -hmm. um, I think it my interpretation of this is that it's really aimed at something that's not just sketched out on some graph paper by yes. the homeowner mm -hmm. uh, and just with the word swale or something water stop here but water. I <laughs> but I think you know as will has testified here the substance of this he prepared as a designer and builder who is a professional in this field and I would say that given this project even if Don Marsh had not Stamp this, um, that it would satisfy me. Thank right. you. As one board member. That's the kind of that's the kind of input I just need as somebody who's collecting these applications yep. and figuring out when they're complete and can come and as forward somebody without. Who's soon not to be on the board, it would seem to me <laughs> there's a variety of kinds of professionals that could weigh in. Mm -hmm. If the goal is, you know, look, you used to not be able to build at all. So yeah. Without right. like marriage, so. So this is something now that we're, you know, the, mm -hmm. the board is allowing, this mm -hmm. the town is allowing, and so you've got to take an extra step. So it could be a landscape architect mm -hmm. who can just say yes in their experience as landscaping and mm -hmm. this will take care of erosion. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I, I, it's, yeah. well, even an excavator for that. Well, I was just going to say a, an experienced contractor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that our assessment could potentially vary depending on the complexity of the project, but there will be cases where we won't understand how complex a project is without a professional opinion. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that may be a catch that we find ourselves in needing to understand better. Yeah, but thank you for this discussion, just so that I have a little sense of when Good. when I might say, oh, you may need to come twice, but let's mm -hmm. try it. <laughs> I plan to offer some feedback to the planning commission for the final Okay. That's okay. Do we have a member from the public yes. out there? A comment from a <laughs> I said one um, microphone. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> just take your no, no. Oh, oh. Uh, are you does he need to get sworn in or is he can Well are you offering come? substantive testimony uh, on the it was, it was, if I was here is the comment that I would Okay. okay. No, I think we can just take that as a comment. Okay. Because uh, I just did a discussion about precedent going forward with the first steep, steep slope application. Um, I think one thing I noticed, maybe I missed it in my review, um, but the source of the existing uh, contours, um, I just didn't see on the plans of whether that I don't was. know if you got the updated with more, oh, more yeah. documents sure. that I provided sure. today sure. that have the existing contours and two foot. Okay. No, I think Rob was just asking what the source, where the did you get source. the existing um, contours from? That was a survey that, um, from when I bought the property, um, I forget who specifically did it, but um, yeah, it was a PDF that I brought in. My, my, su my suggestion was that the plans get updated sort of detail of them how those existing contours were, were, were generated. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, did, I didn't just draw them or pulled off the survey, you know, topography survey. But make sure we have a reference mm -hmm. yeah. to where those come from. Oh, it's good to have a data source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, does that give you guidance going forward? It does. Thank you. Um, and that's a good, next one. good point, Rob, about uh, updating the source of said. Mm -hmm. um, 
contour lines. Okay. Uh, at this point, I think DPW, their comments have and concerns have been satisfied. Um, Mr. Per Sampieri, uh, is there any co other comments you wish to offer? Please. Or questions? Please. Shall I sit over here? Y you can sit or stand at the microphone. And Whichever you're more comfortable Whichever, with. yeah. Okay. I can stand. If, if you're, whatever you're more comfortable with. Well, first, I want to thank uh, the applicant, Will, the city staff, and the board members for considering my comments. I hired Stone Environmental to come out and take a look at the property and make some recommendations as to what could be done to the plans to try to prevent damage to my property from stormwater. And I just wanted to put things, and I think that the applicant has done a good job addressing those concerns, and I commend him for that. Um, I just wanted to briefly put things in perspective so you get an idea of the impact of this project on my property. The property boundary, as you can see, cuts on a diagonal. Mm -hmm. And my backyard is basically right below that diagonal property boundary. Um, and it's also much lower than the property boundary. There's a steep embankment there from my backyard going up to his property. My garage is right below where the new proposed rain garden is. And my house is just a little bit south of there. So, I mean, this really impacts my backyard, the views from my home and my backyard. And my primary concerns are, number one, the possibility of stormwater runoff. You've got a steep hillside from which a tremendous number of trees have been removed over the course of the development of Will's lot and the lot next door. And I think it's really unfortunate that so many trees have been removed. The first developer had one idea for how to develop the property. He removed a lot of trees. Then Will had another idea as to how he wanted to develop his lot. More trees were removed. And now the few remaining trees in this area near the proposed new dwelling unit are right along the property line. And there are four very large trees. I think they're maple trees in proximity to where he wants to put the, parkings, the parking spot there. And you know, he mentioned that that was an existing driveway at one time. I'm not sure about that. I think he might have been right. There was a house on the back of my property that was taken down before 1958. So there, there may have been a grade running up in that direction. It was actually vegetated before Will built his main residence. When that construction took place, the vegetation was, that had grown in in that area was removed. and. My concern with the proposed parking spot there is the impact on the few remaining large trees. Um, as we know, driving and parking vehicles over tree roots compacts the soil and is not good for tree health. The effects may not show up for many years, but it's not good for the tree's health. And here, it just seems like that parking spot really isn't needed. So I would prefer to see two, two parking spots over where he's got one on the north side. It seems like he can have the same amount of parking without jeopardizing the trees and impacting my view. Um, other than that, you know, again, I commend him for addressing my concerns. He's incorporated um, the extensions of the swale design 
and moving the rain garden per Stone's recommendations. Mm -hmm. And I, I really feel like that's probably the best we can do. I think going forward when the rain garden has been constructed and that swale is constructed, we need to be careful that we don't disturb the tree roots when mm -hmm. we're doing that work. I think we need to be flexible about that. Well, I think as I said to you on site, you know, I mean, I think that rather than digging down, you know, build up yeah. as much as possible. Yeah. Of course, you don't want to build up too much oh, yeah. either, because if you bury yeah. tree root, tree yeah. roots are near the surface, so yeah. you don't want to bury them too deeply. But I appreciate that, and we do have a good relationship, and you know, I think we can work together after yeah. the project is completed well, on far vegetation. As, far as your concern of trees, you know, I mean, I want to keep many, as many trees as I can. You know. And, and that's all I had. I, okay. I did have some information responsive to Board Member McCarthy's earlier question about um, flooding incidents on North Street. I've been there for 10 years, and there have been two really horrific incidents during that time. They may have pre, it predated Will's time on the property, but I can think of at least twice when the culvert t was totally blown out mm -hmm. and North Street was basically like a river. And I think there are two problems that continue to exist. There's the runoff from the development uphill that Will mentioned, but also there seems to be too much water flowing down along North Street mm -hmm. and Every spring, the bottom of my front yard, you know, just the strip a couple so. feet from the street is buried in dirt. And that's from water that's flowing down the street. And I don't think it's, most of it's not coming from Will's property, it's coming from up above. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where it originates, but that's a problem. You know, this winter, the city was out putting ice melt like in the drainage ditch along the side of the street, you know, because they were trying mm -hmm. to break up the ice so the water would have a place to flow. Yeah. But th that's all I had. Okay. Thank you. That's, Thank that's helpful to me. It helps, helps my memory of, of the incident that I was remembering. It was one of the heavy, heavy storm water, lots of silt in your driveway incidents rather than a blown out culvert. Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Per Sampieri, um, one question about the car parking. You know, one of the concerns that I expressed before is that to a certain extent, this already exists as a driveway. Um, and so usually when we're looking at these zoning permits, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of minimum parking spaces. And, you know, this, is, this car isn't necessarily, this spot isn't needed as a parking space. So we don't necessarily have the ability to say, well, you can't use the driveway that exists now, um, but we can put conditions on. And I think, so part of it is I think Will has expressed an interest in avoiding root compaction that you're concerned about for the existing trees, but is there a landscaping, if cars were to be in the location that's identified on this map, you know, is there landscaping issues from your perspective that would help mitigate any impact of a car being located there um, on your property views? I mean, I suppose we could put up a vegetative screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a little concerned because Will said that if he wanted to make that a real parking spot, they might have to take down one of the trees. Right. Um, I mean, obviously, I do not want to take that tree down. And as like I said, I'm not ultimately planning to really do much with that parking for now. Um, if and when someday we decide to flatten it out per se, I guess that could be a different Yeah, well, and the other thing is, you would have to, if it was after this permit expired, you'd have to come back to reapply to make that change because the construction has to be completed within the timeline of the permit. Right, so it's a two year. Go ahead. Two car can two cars be easily fit north of the house? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. I mean, and then we with still plenty of room for the rain garden. Park on the other side. Right. Yeah, and how many spaces do you think you have? It looks like there shows two cars, but it looks like a pretty big. I mean, we can fit. You know, I mean, depending on how you pack them in, we can fit four cars on our side. On the other side of the bridge. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. We're going to do some landscaping over there, so it might be you know, like three when we're done. But you know, we, can, we definitely had three or four cars over there. Mm -hmm. So even without the additional parking space to the west of the proposed building, you'd still you you think you could still accommodate four cars on yeah. site? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a disadvantage to taking that westerly parking spot off the site plan, or are you requesting that that flexibility be retained? I mean, I think if Meredith said if it's like, you know, if I don't actually put it in, mm -hmm. make it a official parking spot within the duration of the mm -hmm. permit, then that would come back if I was to say flat it out and make it yeah, I, I want to be clear about that. that that's that's really the, the question is if you were to do additional work, site work, to make that into a spot, that's what you'd have to come back for. But, you know, just as somebody who decides to park a camper on their backyard doesn't necessarily need to come in for a zoning permit yeah. until it becomes a permanent structure yeah. of sorts. Um, but I know. think it's all. I think what Meredith was saying is that you have two years to actually construct the project right. as proposed and as approved, um, so that if you have this proposal to have a parking spot in there and you're not planning on building it within the next two years, then it doesn't make sense to include it in this because, by the regulations, you are supposed to have constructed it within two years if it's part of this plan. Is that what you were saying? Well, there, there's that if there are changes that need to be made, which there are right now some grading changes, but then that is sort of in conflict with Dan's point, which is you can actually park a car there right now because there's a old driveway spot. Well, it's not flat. I mean, you could park no, it's it's right, angle. Right. It just if he wants to park on the slope. But if he wants to park on the yes. slope, then we don't. He doesn't need to propose any right. changes to no, the grade at that sure. location. Right. If he wants to change the grade. Then it has I mean, to I be in the next two years. Ultimately, I'd like to not have a parking spot there. You know, I'm just thinking of my mother, who's you know, still very spry and hiking mountains, but you know, there'll probably come a day when she's not. Well, that, you know, that, that, at that point, maybe we put her in the basement in the apartment there. <laughs> <laughs> is there access into the into the basement? Is there access into the proposed structure from that area, or is it all from well, the north right now? You know, there's there's steps on to the main entrance on the north side, so kind of between the northern parking and the western parking. But then there's also pedestrian access up to sort of the south. There's a door on the south side, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of in that little nook. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't realize. So, so I guess I guess your point is that it can be used as a parking spot even if it's not constructed as a parking spot, and if that were to occur, then um, the neighbors' concerns would not necessarily be addressed. Right, and uh, I'm just thinking to the extent that it exists as a parking space, and um, you know, part part of it is I think this issue goes away if there's some sort of vegetative screening. Um, just to note that because this does not qualify for site plan, there is no landscaping, oh, no landscaping. provision that applies. Okay. I made a little Street. note in here somewhere about that, but site plan totally doesn't apply at all. Um, okay. So we don't, that, the, yeah, don't have the. Yeah. So we don't have to. I mean, I didn't know. Right now. <coughs> privacy screen plantings on that western square. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's been part of the plan all along that, you know, okay. I've been thinking of not fully detailed here. And I mean, we've talked about it a little bit. Um, my wife and I are trying to figure out what, you know, cedars or sea berries or, mm -hmm. you know, a combination of lilacs and these other things. Okay. Or chestnuts. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Sorry, Dan. That's okay. Was all the thunder gone. Um, <laughs> snow storage. Um, where is currently um, most of it ends up, we just basically shovel it, mm -hmm. all of it. Um, <clears throat> it all basically kind of, a lot of it parts stays in the sort of northern parking spot, and then there's areas over on the other side, and a lot of it ends up in the stream. 
Okay. Uh, well, what about the, the rain gardens? Will there be a negative impact if snow storage goes into those? Um, nope. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't plan to store snow since it really are. I mean, sort of it kind of goes, as I said, the majority of it happens on the banks of our mm -hmm. driveway. Okay. Thank you. I had my neighbor try to plow it, and it was a little bit challenging. So far, we've shoveled it, except for one time it's been going. It, it happens. There's, there are those of us out there that can yeah. shovel a driveway. I like it. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So, I think that, is there any other issues that anyone wishes to? I think we've thoroughly reviewed this. Um, if not, I will take a motion. Um, or do we want to take it into deliberative session at the end? Whatever the pleasure of the board at this point. Well, the reason we would take it into deliberative session is if we wish to consider further refinement to our thinking, which right. there may be value to that. I'm not, I can go either way. Yeah. I, I feel like we've come to consensus on, on I agree. most of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to approve the project uh, as proposed and as modified recently by the applicant. Um, okay. Motion by Kevin. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Second by Deb. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion as proposed, please raise your right hand. There will be a written decision forthcoming. Thank you. On your property? No. Yeah. No, we're done. Rob, you want to come up? I will be right back, except I don't get your guys' staff reports. Okay. Mr. Chair, we get back. Excuse me? Okay, well, we're going to take a two-minute break, and then we'll uh, take up the sketch plan.
uh, talk about his issues, give the board an opportunity to ask questions, and then feel free to come up to a microphone and uh, offer things. No one's going under oath because this is the nature of sketch plan. A little bit like Fight Club. Um, <laughs> no, it isn't anything like that. Sorry. Um, with that, Mr. Setter, please. Uh, yeah, we've we've seen this in sort of an even in more informal review, so it might help um, and I, to orient us if you've made any particular changes to the proposal or flush things out. Um, you know, not not incredible amount of changes. Um, you know, sheet A and three is sort of generated. Um, the parking, I don't know where the parking was last time. If it's in the building or not. But, um, Basically, it's massive wide. It's kind of like a, a one-story walkout, a basement walkout. Basically, the downhill side would be two stories tall, the upper side would be one story tall. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, so yeah, looking at doing um, basically, it's a three thousand square foot building, um, five bedroom building with four units. Um, probably smaller than many of the houses. In very Hill. Um, as you know, the, the slopes are a, a thing to contend with. Um, we, uh, we, with the slope analysis that was that's, um, Don Marsh has done, uh, we came up with a, a allowable density of three units, and then um, that in mind, we uh, converted to a planned unit development which gave us a 50% increase, so it's basically four units. Uh, the, uh, the site is got, has a lot of ledge. Uh, we, we just did test bits. Well, we tried to do test bits. Uh, we never really did test bits. <laughs> right. We, we scraped a lot of stuff. But, uh, so it's very ledgy, and I mean, to be honest, I, I don't know where I go from here, so I'm still happy to. I would, I would still love to get feedback and, and comments, and, and assume this project is still moving ahead. But at this point, I really don't know. Okay. Um, so that was a little scary. But um, and and is that is that largely because the cost of drilling into the ledge to? Actually, you know, it wasn't even that. It's about getting a septic system on the property. Right. Um, that uh, just wasn't enough. Perkable. Terrain and perkable soil, even with the best of metal systems. You end up within reaching distance of the city sewer, presumably. Right. Yes, I believe this, the city far sewer stop. Actually, there's a line that comes up, but I guess it's a private line about maybe a quarter of the way from Murray Drive, mm -hmm. Murray Hill Drive, up to this property, which is still quite a distance away. And, and I know there's wells in that field next to that. And the soil types really don't change, so there's probably ledge over where your wells are, I'm assuming. Um, so even if I were to think about trying to connect within the right of way or something like that, I don't want to disturb their wells. That sounds like a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, as far as if, if you have glass, that can, can change things with the, uh, with the, the underground water. So. Um, so yeah, so I don't know where we're heading with that right now. Um, yeah, what else can I tell you? So you know, wood site trying to maintain, keep as much of the wood character as possible. Um, I know there, there was an issue. I mean, sort of main issue at technical review really was a turnaround of uh, uh, emergency vehicles, and I, I no problem. I, Totally agree. We should have some kind of turnaround capability for, for the ambulance, and it was agreed that you know to back down the uh, you know, fire trucks is an acceptable uh, solution. Um, well, let's see. What else? What else can I tell you? Uh, what else? Do you have questions? So, you, I'll maybe direct i think you know one of one of the areas and you saw at some length that we went to with the steep slopes um so i i know that one thing we're, we're going to to need and i know don has done 
these preliminary drawings for you, but you know we'd need <clears throat> his final sign off on this. No, uh, it was very good sitting in that last. As well as the erosion control That's issues, you know, both both pre-construction and you know you, your your proposal in some ways is a little different than the, the last one. Not that it's an apples to orange comparison, but you know the wall that you're proposing is really <clears throat> against the the. Um, the natural topography and how water will then come and be diverted around right. and dealt with um, so it doesn't shed off or create either problems for you as I'm sure you want to avoid but also in a way the water sheds off the property or re is retained on the property. I think that's just something that I, I'd want to see um, develop to a greater extent as you uh, but obviously putting the money into that is doesn't make sense until you know you're going forward with the project right. but it would definitely be at the next stage we'd want to yep. see um, and that's consistent with the 3008 and you know this is this goes back to the question that we were facing before you know do you need a stamp sealed engineer saying this is an erosion control plan that conforms with it um, or do you can you can you achieve the same end with something slightly less um, and I can't, as one board member, give you particular guidance on this, but I think it would be important to have the topography and under understand the impact that the building has on the topography for the answer to that question. Um, you know, and this has a big, this is talking about installing a driveway that doesn't exist now. <clears throat> it's going to cross cut up there, so I think that creates issues in and of itself for how that drainage works. Um, right. But those are things I'd, I'd, I would want to see, as I suspect the other board members would. Um, I was talking the technical review just to bring that up. We're doing a, uh, you know, obviously we'd be in a culvert at the curb cut. Um, and why <coughs> do we drive for, for mm -hmm. two lane traffic there for a distance so that cars coming in and out? Um, and, and also, as far as drainage, uh, doing sort of basically a cross cut in between the driveway another culvert within there to alleviate some of the water. Right. right. And just snow storage issues where that yeah. would the driveway. Um, then, um, you know, on, uh, not to jump around, but another point, and it's, it's made in the staff report, but, you know, how this building would be essentially owned is this would this be something where you would own the building and rent out the units yes as a multifamily or as opposed to a condominium yeah, you know where it'd be, it'd be, it'd be rent rental rent units out. okay um right and then you've already addressed the technical review question about the ambulances and the width of the driveway the ability for an ambulance or fire truck to turn around um Yeah, sorry, <laughs> ambulance is around. That's, yeah. Um, uh, well, you're thinking that there's a couple things I did want to just touch base on the, the um, landscape plan. Mm -hmm. um, aside from erosion control and the stormwater management and all that sort of thing. Um, and given the fact of the, the wooded nature of the site, uh, just wondering, if, if, is there a possibility of getting a waiver for the, the, the landscape plan prepared by a certified landscape architect or horticulturist? And I mean, obviously, I would have we would have a site plan that said this area is basically undisturbed. Mm -hmm. with some, you know, weeding out the, the trees that are rotting or whatever that kind of stuff. Just general forest maintenance. Yeah, I don't know if we could you necessarily. Keep the rotten trees. <laughs> you can keep the rotten trees. It's good for the dirt. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, I don't know if we have the necessarily have the authority to, to waive yeah, the, really the landscaping. Um, <laughs> but you know, one thing I would say or note is that you know when we talk about this this landscaping and screening. Um, because you're proposing a very naturalistic setting, it's not a particularly complicated landscape plan. Um, you know, more than anything, what we're often 
concerned about are things such as screening, um, but also, you know, not introducing invasive species or, um, you know, having things that can't be maintained or that are likely to fail. Um, you know, so I, I think having, because it says applications for major site plan review shall include a landscape plan prepared by a licensed landscape architect or certified horticulturalist, I think that's a fairly broad and flexible series of categories. I mean, I don't know if a certified horticulturalist, who, what, who certifies that, and it's not defined in the, the zoning bylaws. So, you know, I think we're just looking for someone with a, again, to use the analogy I think Ryan used, which was as opposed to somebody on graph paper saying, you know, like tree and bush, yeah. having, having a slightly more sophisticated plan, even if that plan is leave trees and shrubs as are. Um, yeah, I mean, I can even, yeah, see, uh, I mean, consulting with um, the tree warden. Um, John? Yeah, John Snell? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right, so you know, I mean, consulting with him as far as that kind of thing, would that be? Well, I mean, I know, in we, reality, I don't really see, like, I mean, this isn't a type of, Site right, well, and, nor nor are we expecting this to turn into an arboretum yeah. either. Yeah. But I think what again, what we're really looking for, and you know, part of that I can't answer as to whether it's satisfactory. I think it's one of those things where what we're looking for is a plan that's been developed with some degree of sophistication, um, so that it does not. Um, is, so there, you know, some of these issues that are behind these landscaping and screening bylaws are thoughtfully applied um, because, you know, they, they have charged us with a fairly vigorous and robust landscaping requirement on these major site plan reviews so that, you know, we don't just put in houses there and cut everything down <laughs> or make it devoid of any type of, of landscaping that will transition or, or you know, facilitate how that, how that house um, blends into the existing wooded environment. Because it will be an intrusion. I mean, there are, there are going to be impacts visually by putting a house there and <clears throat> putting a driveway. And so I think whether the ideas of the landscaping plan is how do you mitigate those impacts or, you know, in the forward, going forward, how do you, how do you create something that's, that's sustainable, um, you know, so that these impacts don't, and, and part of it may be a very just simple natural, let nature take its course, let the natural growth of the forest continue, um, not put in manicured <clears throat> pieces of shrubbery, but I think that's, that's simply, you know, I've probably said more thought than many landscaping plans in our old bylaws ever had. Well, and in, in this situation, especially because there is a lot of ledge if this goes forward, it may also be helpful to have that landscaper design, you know, landscape designer, whoever it is, work also with the stormwater so that you're working in some green stormwater, you know, applications and that might be more of what the landscaping is in some ways than anything else is identifying which trees stay and where are you putting green stormwater infrastructure and what is going to be in that for plants of oh, the uh, exterior lighting plan uh, again similar kind of thing i mean i don't i think that that you know, my guess is that section of the ordinance was based for parking lots and maybe yeah. multiple homes with street lights and that sort of thing. But, okay. We've we've treated this I you know not necessarily having um, an entire sort of dark sky um, analysis as to sort of foot candle lights as you know part of this depends on this, the amount of lighting you're yeah, proposing. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know if you're planning on lighting up the driveway or at the bottom of the driveway or if it's simply around the, the parking area. I mean, you know, a good example of why we have the robust lighting are <clears throat> certain properties on Northfield Street that, you know, are very well, lit, very well lit up that are inconsistent with other uh, properties around Montpelier that have favored sort of the dark sky 
initiative that, that our bylaws uphold. So, I mean, if you're proposing just a few lights that are consistent, and obviously we want cut sheets with those yep. to show that they have the full cutoff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely provide a lighting layout, cut sheets. Right. I, I don't analysis. think we need a lumen. It's just the, uh, right, it's just that the major site plan, I think what his point was, was getting a professional, yeah. you know, a professional lighting design or engineer to sign off on it. Yeah. I don't think it needs to be. It's not. It, yeah. We're not looking it's at. Be all we're not like stuff. Everybody understands. It's right. Not like a, and I, I think you know this isn't saying it needs to be one of the full big light analysis right, where you have the points everywhere. Candles, right, it just says a lighting candles. plan prepared. What is actually in that lighting plan? Okay. You know, I, I think mm -hmm. your typical stuff that we see and. A memo uh, from the engineer, maybe? Yeah. I, I, you know, you have a site design engineer who's mm -hmm. going to make recommendations, and you can just simply ask him to uh, uh, make recommendations on lighting. And I, I would suspect, unless it's a more sophisticated lighting plan than I'm picturing, that that, that will largely be... And I'm only one board member, if any other board members feel strongly about this. I mean, uh, we've often been more reactive on lighting plans than proactive, which is, you know, when we see the lighting plan, if there does appear to be issues, um, we usually will drill deeper and may um, have applicants go back to have things redesigned again. You know, there are certain properties where that has, that has come up. Mm -hmm. Uh, in part because it's really cheap to put a big spotlight on a building and illuminate a big area as opposed to running a pole out that might create the same lighting in a less intrusive manner. Um, and those are obviously our concerns um, as well as in the bylaws. Any other questions from the board? I have a couple of questions, one of which may be me learning about the this newish bylaw. We haven't talked a lot about infill housing, PUDs, um, and so I guess it's a question from Meredith. Um, applicability says infill housing developments are permitted in several zoning districts, including this one, residential 9,000, on parcels not more than two acres in size. Does mm -hmm. that mean that we have to consider all PUD, infill PUDs? Because in my mind, this I, I don't see this meeting the purposes of the infill PUD. Can you tell me which page you're on? Just sure, I'm on page 3-72 of the zoning, and it's section 3401, mm -hmm. infill housing development. Um, so I guess my question is, do we evaluate the applicability of this option based on applicability or the purposes or both? Because the applicability um, says yes, but it doesn't match the purposes in, in my interpretation. And uh, I'm also I, just I, one board member. Yep. Well, I, I think it, I think, I think it, you, you need to look at both. Otherwise, why are the purposes there? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, I mean, this is this is the first time I've worked through this, which is one reason that I have the purposes of the section in here completely spelled out, as well as the applicability. Yeah, um, yeah, um, and I, I just I want before I ponder this in a meeting setting, I want to understand if the applicant has a, a strict right to apply for this as a infill PD based on the applicability section. Because if yes, then I I'm done. But if, if I no, I can't answer this. that question, Kate. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. I just threw it at you, so that that is okay. Um, I mean, it might be something to ask the city zoning council if they mm -hmm. want a planning commission. Uh, no, the attorney. Oh, the attorney. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Attorney. That council. Oh, go oh, council. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, and, 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 and so. I'm, be, I'm being vague, but Which section is yeah, sorry. It's chapter 340, and it's section 3401, and it's page 3-72. In in the bylaws. In the bylaws. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he, standards. Yes, it's part of the sub the planned unit development standards. Okay. Yeah. And the, the reason that I'm asking is that the three purposes one has the purpose of encouraging an increase in the amount of housing generally and in affordable housing in particular located in downtown and surrounding neighborhoods. And this seems remote to be a surrounding neighborhood. Um, allow for further residential development on vacant or underutilized lots within developed neighborhoods. This is adjacent to undeveloped neighborhood, but it's kind of not a part of a neighborhood. Um, 
mass and scale must reflect the character of the existing streetscape, maintain the privacy of adjacent residences, and fit comfortably in the existing neighborhood. I, I think in, in my brain, because it's a parcel that's kind of remote from, no, remote's a strong word, um, it's not really tied into a neighborhood. I just don't know how it can fit comfortably in the existing neighborhood. Those are the types of questions that are being raised for me when I look at this. And yet, it's zoned at, I think it's 9,000. Mm -hmm. So it's anticipated that there will be development, I think. Yep. If we look at this on the broader mm -hmm. citywide scale. Mm -hmm. So your point is well taken, but mm -hmm. there are other counter currents that are also mm -hmm. need to be considered in that evaluation. Sure. So that 9,000 square foot lot anticipates 9,000 square foot lots or, or greater. Um, what we're talking about, or the reason it even comes, catches my attention, is that the infill housing development PUD allows to, one to access a density bonus, mm -hmm. which gives you more than one unit per 9,000 mm -hmm. square feet. And so um, that's something I noticed as, as I was looking at it. Um, so is, it, is the difference between three units versus four units? Well, I think that's that. I mean, that's obviously what comes. The, the, I mean, it's no, the bigger uh, issue, right? Yeah. Like yeah. Precedent. And yeah. 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 This is the part of town where we should be dan granting density bonuses. I guess is what I'm getting at. And if the bylaw says we should, then I'll go with that. I, I, I mean, I'll offer a gloss that only reflects my thinking, not any type of consensus or binding legal opinion, but, you know, I'm often gu guided by the, the actual, you know, the, the sort of meat and potato standards that you apply um, with, the, with these provisions, and I think the applicability standard lays it out, and I think the purposes undergird it, but it's, that they are not in and of themselves the test on the applicability of, of whether this can apply to a particular lot, um, and I think that your point is 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 a valid one. Except, you know, we have a parcel that's located within a district that's been zoned for this plan. You because it could have been zoned a number of other ways, okay. um, and so while you know some of these purposes. You know, and part of it is sort of a little bit of the sub subjectivity, which is to say, you know, allow for further residential development on vacant or underutilized lots within developed neighborhoods. I mean, this is adjacent to a rather developed neighborhood of Murray Hill that has a very large residential component to it. And does that mean just simply because it's adjacent to it that it's not within it? Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I think an argument could be constructed both ways, and that's the concern that I would have as to making that a gatekeeper um, for whether someone is eligible for a PUD infill, only because it invites then a challenge as opposed to giving us a, a brighter line test for this, which is under the subsection B. Can can I throw one other little wrench in the works? Yeah. So are you all thinking of this as, I know it says little n neighborhoods, and yes, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, are we thinking what we think of as visual neighborhoods saying, yeah, technically this parcel lies within the defined Murray Hill neighborhood? But we're not looking at that big neighborhood. We're looking at the things right here, right next to it, along the street, as you can see it when you're driving up Main Street. Mm. I, yeah, I mean, I think that's where that's one of those things where neighborhood itself isn't necessarily defined as a term. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, what makes up a neighborhood? Um, no, and that's why I, I'm just asking yeah, because no. there is a defined neighborhood, which is the Murray Hill neighborhood mm -hmm. for zoning purposes, which right. this falls into. Okay, I'm just. No, that's I, great. I, it is one of the problems I find in how this is drafted sometimes is that they're not really clear on what they're talking about. Right. It's almost like it would be more clarifying if it said within, like in three, comfortably into the existing neighborhood type 
we, I mean, because we've got these Murray Hill neighborhood and Highland neighborhood, right. and that, yeah. that would direct what we are comparing its compatibility or, or with. Or only use neighborhood with a capital N when you're talking about neighborhoods and just pick another word. Mm -hmm. Right. help me, but. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for exploring that. I, guess, I, guess I, I, I had a couple thoughts on the um, the density bonus, and when I first read that section. I kind of thought that it wasn't just the fourth unit that needed to have the criteria applied, that, and I don't know. Maybe that's something we consider in our discretion of whether we allow this or not. But it seems like the intent of the regulation was to create multiple units of of that. Mm -hmm. But I. I I, th I don't. I'm not saying that it was calculated wrong in the staff report. I'm just saying it to consider that maybe more units should be should have, uh, should fit the criteria oh, for the P. I, I see that. It's just that in 3401C it specifically says additional. if each of the additional dwelling units meets at least three of the following criteria. Okay. It says additional. <laughs> yeah. Trust right. me. I, I read that several times to make sure that because it seems it seems weird to me as well. Yeah. The, the only the extra bonus one has to meet those. Yeah, exactly. I. Uh, okay, so the other, I guess, bigger picture I wanted to put in perspective is is that if someone were to build a single family home and maximize their disturbance, mm -hmm. like their their buildable area, I mean, to convey the benefit to the public of that type of you know disturbance on a buildable lot mm -hmm. versus you know more units where you do have you know some benefit of the public of you know energy efficiency and these other types of things that I don't know I think that's something that we should mm -hmm. discuss as a part of moving forward here yeah, yeah. I, I agree and I think I mean I, I'm actually in looking at this again I don't I'm not at all clear as to what the purpose of this was I mean I think it's reasonable to read the applicability as to say you can only do this in these neighborhoods. It doesn't make sense then that if you're in these neighborhoods that you get to do it as a matter of right because then it's all the language about, you know, may apply for a bonus and the whole purpose section doesn't seem to make sense. Mm -hmm. And this, this applicability is pretty uh, general. general. It would mm -hmm. apply to pretty much any PUD in any of these zoning mm -hmm. districts, which seems to undermine this obviously sort of discretionary purpose of this section as far as us uh, considering and determining on a case-by-case -case basis whether we want to grant a bonus. Um, that said, I also agree with Rob, I think. So I don't think, I, I don't know, maybe, I don't know that we need to get an opinion on this. I don't think, I think Kate's initial question was, do we have to just allow this as a PUD? My inclination is probably not. It seems like this section is intended to give us discretion whether or not we grant the bonus associated with the infill housing PUD. Mm -hmm. But I also think that we should look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And here, it seems like uh, the purposes, general purposes of PUDs are accomplished by this project and that it's being proposed in a way that uh, is certainly gonna minimize impacts. And so, those are my initial thoughts. Okay. Thanks. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> any other comments or any other questions? Um, Ms. Riegelstone, do you have? Yeah. Do you want me to? Yeah. Stand here? Yes. Uh, you go up to the microphone and um, just introduce yourself. Yeah. So, Eric Riegelstone, uh, I'm here on behalf of, I'm president of uh, Murray Hill Homeowners Association, which abuts the land that's being proposed to be developed. Uh, I guess the one concern that we really do have is uh, uh, septic. If it were to be able to be built, which sounds questionable, um, whether it would be susceptible to contaminating our water supply that is up there. Um, it is This property is located quite closely to a few of our wells, so that would give us great concern. Uh -huh. um, if it were to move forward, we would certainly um, ask that you require um, testing be done. Uh, I don't know how the testing works. I'm not first in all that, but we have an agreement with Mont Compost Company that um, the water quality gets tested on a yearly basis, and, and they they foot the bill for that mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that their road, you know, their their runoff is not contaminating our water supply. Um, and then uh, I, I think the only one of the things that came up tonight, hearing that there was a lot of ledge um, that was encountered. 
when they were trying to dig some pits would be, you know, obviously the, the homes that are currently existing up there are pretty close to this property. Um, how, do you, how do you remove that ledge? Do you do blasting? Um, and, and where does that leave the homeowners um, if something were to occur at one of those homes? Mm -hmm. So those, those are concerns that, that we have at the moment. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, Jim, did you have? I don't have any comments. I'm, I'm Jim Trench. I'm a adjacent property owner. Actually, we share a lot line. Here. Home Invisible One. That's right. We share a lot line. But I'm just interested to hear the discussion. So, okay. no comments or questions. Good. Um, well, and you know, obviously, those, some of those concerns are um, shouldn't be restricted to the hearing here. Um, and I, I mean, it was noted in the staff report that, and it sounds like the the public sewer system is not that far away. And if it sounds like there's a any way to maybe work, if Murray sells homeowners association's interest is not having an on-site septic for possibly risking the wells, maybe that's a possible avenue to work out some sort of easement just for a, a pipe to hook into the municipal sewer system uh, to avoid any risk that uh, you know an on-site system might especially given the kind of un unknown nature of the underground topography. I think a question to explore related to that is whether this is within or outside the city's sewer service area and whether it would require an extension at the expense to the city. Well, I and mean, that's, I mean, when we had the technical review committee meeting, I mean, technically it's outside of the area. There would have to be an extension to reach the yeah. pipe yeah, that, that is there the right now. Um, and I believe you said there's a possibility you're going to have you would have to basically drill through, blast through ledge to make that connection. I mean, Potentially. I thought, yeah, that just. Yeah. Well really yeah. Right. yeah. So it's it's troublesome. It's yeah. a difficult situation. So your project um, is even more complicated than we when we left last saw <laughs> Yeah. <it>. yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, I, guess, I guess I have one other question. Just, yes. Just because I'm not versed in development and this type of thing. What, what would place this potential development um, to not happen? Like, what, what would the land, the, the demographics of the land, prevent a sewer system from being installed? How does that work? Do you? Like, would, what would... Like I mean, city sewer? What are the needs? No, like, I'm sorry, do your own septic system. Oh. Um, like, what would the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't have the right. Geology? Yeah, what, what, what would prevent that from being, from them being able to put in a septic system? Well, I mean, I think that's just. Is a, it like the degree of the land? Is it the, 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 the makeup, soil, the, the soil components? Type. Soils. So, so it's either per, but, right, they look at the slopes of the soil. Okay, that's, that's what I guess what it, we're getting at. Like there's, there's a couple different systems. And they need different kinds of space, and so they'll oh. work with an engineer to okay. see if it's possible. It, it, but it sounds like you don't have any of those. Thing. You don't have any of those details at the moment. You're just no, kind of, no, yeah, okay. Right. No, I didn't know how no, far along that was. No. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's a whole review process to get a state permit. Yeah. So okay. that's all yeah. under. Yeah, I was going to say we don't really tend to give permit. We well, we don't give permits for septic systems. No, I understand that. I, just, I don't. Yeah, that's what allows you to make to be able to put one in, and what allows you not? To it's do it. engineers make that call and do that report through to the state, and we look at that and say, oh, does it, has an engineer said that they could actually put a septic okay. system it, here? If you think about two two of the biggest things, the soil type. You know, is this impenetrable clay or is this nice sandy soil where it can mm -hmm. go down? And how close to the surface is the ledge? Um, because the stuff has to go right. down and stay down. And in the permit <clears throat> program, they take in, in, into account overshadowing, which is whether or not an on-site system could affect drinking wells. So you'll, you'll be notified if that process goes forward as an adjoining landowner, particularly okay. with wells, so that you'll be able to have your own engineers take a look to make sure that you're comfortable that there won't be this. It's called overshadowing. Uh, it's not often you ask a septic question at a... Uh, Zoning board meeting and get an answer from the secretary of A and R. We go high, we go low. We go <laughs> so.
Okay. Um, any other th yeah, there are other feedback other we can that anyone else has that yeah. is where to go forward. I guess I'm curious what you're envisioning for the so the part of the plan you development, you know you have condensed development, then you have open space that's kind of communal. Mm -hmm. And you've got that marked off as this like thirty five by hundred and thirty foot common open space area. Are you are you what are you envisioning that looking like? You, Natural oh, yeah, I mean I, I, I been up there and, and uh, driven by it. Um, if you um, shoot AO2 to the photographs, um, you look at photograph C up over the right corner. It, yeah. it, it, it's the best part of the property, basically. It's kind of a nice level out area. Um, there's not many trees in it, but it's tree line. So I, I would see, you know, that would probably be the one area where you'd have a stretch of lawn or something that you can go out and kick a soccer ball on. <laughs> okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, You're cringing at the no, idea. No, 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 no. <laughs> it was this actually connecting for a second when I tried to get it connected during DRC. Oh. Oh, I didn't, uh... <laughs> okay. Good refusal. So, um, okay. It, so pretty much like, you know, during the winter, I would anticipate it looking very much like a photograph C. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It seems to be that there's you can see the path there and there must be the snowshoe. Nice. Right. Staff has highlighted for us, Smith highlighted for us um, evaluation of one of the subdivision character subdivision? Yep. Subdivision standards, which is character of the neighborhood and settlement pattern. Land is not being subdivided here, though, is it? Except we have to look at that for PUD. Right. All PUDs okay. have to go through the subdivision criteria, okay. um, subdivision standards. Some of these clearly don't apply in this situation. Mm -hmm. The character of the neighborhood still has right. to be evaluated. Right. So, so that's one that is a, a, a newer aspect of the zoning, again, where we have these different neighborhoods, the Murray Hill neighborhood, and it, we, we are required to assess the compatibility of a project with the character of the neighborhood. And um, it talks about um, residential developments with single family homes and townhouses, and these would function much like townhouses. Um, and it also says it may feature infill residential development where infrastructure is available and to the extent feasible given the availability and ownership of land in this neighborhood. It really strikes me that this was written without thinking of the parcel that you're looking at. It really sounds like about the existing. Um, so so that, that's just an area where we may have more discussion um, should this return to the to the board. Yep. Good point. Is, is there anything that comes to mind with that, like like when you think of the character of that? Because it is it's a fair amount of open space. There's yeah. Not, there's not any uh, architectural character. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that we even see. If, that, you know, we're trying to yeah. align. Yeah. If know, you look at the beginning of our zoning bylaws, where it describes the neighborhoods, it gives some neighborhood character descriptions. Yeah. And this is big end neighborhoods, so they've been sort of broken up and into these 50 some odd neighborhoods, and they have some descriptions. So, you know, as you develop and adding that narrative to sort of underscore why this would be consistent with the existing neighborhood and how it would fit in and reinforce that, as opposed to introducing something new. I mean, this is a standard that we're struggling with as a, as a board, I'll be honest, is that, um, you know, because, you know, again, it's so, somewhat like this infill PUD, where it's a mixture of some of them are somewhat subjective and somewhat objective standards and tests and how we integrate those into the application. Um, we're still f feeling through, but the more you can make then uh, a showing of that, then the yeah. easier our job is to approve. Yeah. yeah. So the, the two or three sentence description yeah. of this neighborhood yeah. is really what you're using. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 what we got. That's what the character okay. of the neighborhood yeah. gives us. So good. Yeah. Anything else? So obviously, it sounds like the next step for you is going to be much more on the technical side to figure out if you can if you can build, let alone whether you can get a zoning permit for it. Um, obviously, you've heard concerns of the neighbors. They're good people to keep in the loop as you move forward. 
um, o only because, and I'll just I say this to every applicant, you know, obviously there comes times there come times where what you want and what a neighbor wants they differ, and it comes down to the law. But to the extent that such issues, like the last application, where they were able to, I think, integrate some of those concerns into changes beforehand, obviously makes the permit process go smoother. Um, and I would certainly encourage that conversation. So, okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, any other business? Um. Just a quick note for anybody who is not in the planning and zoning job per se, that uh, Tuesday, June 18th is the Spring Planning and Zoning Forum. If anybody's interested, I can forward details to you if you want. But we got like five flyers for them, so I figured sure. I'd just let you know. Good. Where's it being held this year? Lake Maury. Huh. Nice. That's why it's fun. Is the oh, city going to foot the bill for us to attend? And, uh, <laughs> part of our big uh, DRV yeah. budget? I, I have yeah. no idea if it has <laughs> ever happened or not. I don't know if you would qualify as a VLCT member. Mm -hmm. I do. I don't know if any of you do. Yeah. <laughs> what? Doesn't the AG ask... have a junket budget? <laughs> maybe, maybe they do, maybe they don't. <laughs> Let's see what bearing that has on whether the inquiry as to whether the city is going to pay for me to attend this conference. Uh, a lot of it looks like it's me about municipal planning grants this year. Um, Another upcoming event, if I may share, yes. is that um, the Downtown Historic Preservation Conference is being held right in Montpelier, scattered oh. sites throughout the city, including this one. Um, and that's on June 5th, 5th yep. so Wednesday. And I'll be facilitating a session, so come on down. Yep. And members of our local Historic Preservation Commission will be involved as well. That's right. And and where, our, where, our where will it be? Should be? What's that? Where, where will it be? Oh, in Montpelier, scattered sites. Oh, scattered so sites. So kind of yeah. move from site to site depending on the workshop that you're going to. And include some walking tours. And depending on whether or not the legislature has wrapped up or not. Don't even say. By June. Well, no, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So one I. other <laughs> one other piece. I'll just um, the conservation commission has uh, reached out to Meredith and I, mm. asking us to come to their meeting this Thursday, because there are bylaw provisions that talk mm. about recommendations from the conservation commission, and they wanted, I think they wanted to ask some questions and some initial feedback. So Meredith and I were planning on going to that. Obviously, if there's anything larger out of that conversation, we'll share it with you at the next meeting. Um, well, even if they're small things, we'll still share. We won't be stingy with the information we get. Um, thanks, but yeah. You're <laughs> yeah, thanks for attending. I'm glad they reached out. Uh, so with that, our next regular meeting is Monday, May 20th, uh, 2019. Maybe. If. So there are no applications for that. Nothing got continued from tonight. So if members want training, we could try and do some training, or you could have the night off. Uh, just a question about uh, uh, the uh, fine arts, College of Fine Arts. That application has been removed. Just withdrawn. Removed. It's not tabled, it's withdrawn, because yeah. they, they, they may not make a decision on what they're doing until the end of the summer. Okay. So that is so completely it'll withdrawn. It'll be a completely new, new application, new public notice process, new fees. Uh -huh. They have withdrawn the whole thing because the whole they, they aren't quite sure how they're going forward and when. Okay. Okay. Um, so what's do any inkling or we can... You can also decide yeah, we a can, little bit. You can think about whether or not you want some sort of training. And, and let, I'm let me. I'm untrainable. Let me. <laughs> yes. Um, notwithstanding that, um, I'll tell you what. Why don't we? Uh, what I would suggest, as opposed to sort of nebulous uh, training, um, why don't we think about if there is anything specific that we do want to talk about? Uh, and at best, what I would say is we would have a short session, but otherwise. Um, if people want the, the Monday off, if the weather's nice, um, there's no reason uh, not to enjoy what little summer we have. Well, that, and if you do want, if we do want some form of training, I would need to know 
quickly so that yeah let's Mike decide before the end out. of the week if, if somebody has a, a, a strong or compelling suggestion I, I would say that would make sense otherwise um, um, I'm, I'm disinclined to request a training opportunity on May 20th disinclined to request <laughs> <laughs> right. I think we should give Meredith a night off well, let's give it yeah is that off. yes <laughs> okay uh, then we won't plan for a training session and uh, short of there becoming another session, then that would push our next regularly scheduled Seven, meeting right here. June. to June, June 3rd. 3rd. Yep. 7 p.m. here. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Move, motion by Kate, second. Second. Second by Kevin. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You.